Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development Crop Talk webinar series. If you have any questions during this presentation today, please type them into the question section of the GoToWebinar menu and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and you will receive a link to the recording. Thank you. Thanks, Laurie. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to the June 23rd edition of Crop Talk. And uh, today we'll uh, start with a little bit of uh, an update as to what uh, was, is going on. And then uh, from there, uh, we'll uh, go into a soybean and dry bean update with Dennis Lang. It's uh, the soybean crop and dry beans have been uh, progressing fairly well. And I thought it'd be a good opportunity for Dennis to uh, make a few comments regarding how they've been doing, things to look out for, and some of the things he's been seeing. And then from there, we'll uh, go into the scrap, crop scouting panel. And uh, we've got a few questions uh, that have come in over the past week, and then a couple, uh, or one or two, that I've, uh, I've thrown in as well. So uh, I guess with that, uh, we'll start with a little bit of an update here. And... Um, I guess one of the things that uh, I still remains our limiting factor right now is the uh, conditions to uh, to crop production and uh, and our and getting better yields. Uh, uh, rain over the next uh, week to ten days is something that we're definitely uh, would be good. Uh, we got a lot of the early seeded cereal crops. Uh, that are starting to head or in the flag leap uh, stage and um, you know just to help finish filling that head and maybe to get a little bit more more height on on some of those crops I think uh, seen a few comments uh, and talked to a few producers where uh, they're saying there was a year it was a year that the uh, mother nature put uh, a plant growth regulator in in uh, uh, on her own so uh, we definitely have some short crop out there. Uh, canola varies uh, from seedling to bolting stage, and uh, and and a lot of times that's in the same field. So we're definitely going to have some issues with uh, canola as we go through the rest of the growing season. Uh, the good thing is, uh, looks like uh, we've uh, maybe won the battle with flea beetles. Uh, most of the fields I've been in over the past few days uh, are. Uh, are definitely uh, starting to fill in and cabbage out. So I think uh, I think we've uh, we've won that battle for this year. Um, fungicide application is going to start, and I think that'll be part of our uh, our panel today. And uh, and then we have a few uh, other things going on. So uh, again, just a brief update of what I've been seeing. I didn't go into the soybeans or the peas because we have Dennis on, and Dennis is going to go into that. So I think uh, with that, Laurie, we'll turn the uh, screen over to Dennis and uh, we'll uh, start with his presentation. Uh, thank you, Lionel. We're just gonna load up the uh, slideshow here. There we go. Alrighty, well, I'm gonna get into just a little bit of background on the soybean production. First of all, just one slide here. Um, you can see on this particular slide here, uh, this kind of gives us a historic uh, view of where soybeans have been um, this past year, kind of projections right now in that 1.3 million acre range right now is what we're looking at. Um, up from last year where we were just over a million acres. Um, our five-year average, five is 35 bushels an acre and our 10-year average is 35 bushels an acre. So it just gives you a bit of a context on where, uh, where things are at for acres in Manitoba. Um, a big swing this year, or I guess a, a more interest in conventional soybeans this year than we've, we've seen in the past. Um, typically, they make up about 2% of the acres in the past. So last year was around 13,000 acres. Uh, this year, there's uh, we're expected to increase our acres. Uh, my early estimates are somewhere in that 30,000 acre range. I'm hearing lots of comments from retailers that there are some conventional soybeans out there. Uh, there's companies contracting and uh, with the strong prices. Uh, I look forward to seeing what kind of yields we're going to have later on. And uh, with that, um, what I thought I would do today is kind of just kind of talk a little bit about uh, the frost that we have in soybeans. Uh, I thank uh, Terry Butts, my colleague out in Beaujolais, for sending me these slides. Um, unfortunately, they had some frost up in that area, and that frost occurred on May 27th, Thursday. So uh, he went out on... Uh, on uh, May 31st uh, to take some pictures to see what was happening because we were looking for regrowth, right? 
So this first slide here that you see, uh, this is a dead and die. So uh, it took a few days, but you can definitely see that uh, not all soybeans made it. Uh, it was cold enough. Uh, it was you know minus one or, or minus two for a number of hours in some areas. Uh, it wasn't a widespread frost. It was uh, select fields, if you want to call it that. And we wanted to see how much regrowth uh, we would have. And you can see here that uh, some of these plants have started to regrow just after a few days. Um, Moving forward, uh, he came back on June 7th and he actually flagged some beans to see what they would see. And uh, in that situation, we did start to see a little bit of, bit, bit of regrowth happening here, um, but not as much as what if we waited another week. And then you can start to see the trifolids coming out. So with that being said, um, what did we learn this year? Well, patience is the key. Um, Soybeans don't regrow after just a couple of days. It takes a few days of good growing conditions to really kind of grow out of it. Um, if the frost hits that hypopodal or the hook uh, as it's coming out, those are the ones that really got hit hard. Uh, those ones didn't make it through. There was no opportunity for regrowth. Uh, what's important if you're trying to make a decision on replanting, um, you need to do a plant stand count. Um, ideally, you want to be between 140 and 160,000 plants per acre. Uh, that would be a good uh, an av or a good stand for, for soybeans. That's where you want to be. Um, but if you're counting live plants and you're you're down to that 80,000, um, I would still suggest leaving it at that point because uh, with the glyphosate tolerant soybeans that we have, um, if that's what you're growing, then uh, you'll still be able to keep it clean and still have some very good yield pot potential. Uh, some of the other things to kind of consider is. Um, you want to check with your seed company that you purchased your seed from to see what type of replant program you have if you are considering any replanting. Um, if you can go and replant between rows to help build a population, that might be a best course of action when it's getting late in the season because this frost was so late. Um, if it was a little bit earlier, sometimes those decisions are easier to make to wait. But when you're at the uh, at the deadline and you have to make a decision, sometimes you know trying to go in and top up a, a population may be your best course of action. Um, not every field is the same. Uh, proper stand assessments is very important. So being able to go out to the fields that you suspect have frost damage and do some counts. So the photograph that you see here is, uh, uh, Terry calls it a tail of three beans. So um, this particular image here, you can see the regrowth from axillary buds. And that's typically what happens when your main growing point is, is done. Um, this particular soybean here, there's no regrowth. These were taken on the same day, of course and there's absolutely no regrowth, so that plant is done. And the grower actually did replant some beans in that same uh, field as well. And you can see here that those beans have, have, uh, have really started to push. So in this particular instance, uh, what the grower did is they did an assessment of the field and decided to go and replant between the rows uh, and replant in areas where the frost damage was most severe to help build this population, rather than ripping up the whole field. Um, there were a number of fields though that uh, did recover and I think patience is the key because sometimes just trying to go out the next day doesn't always uh, doesn't do you any good. You have to give it a you know probably at least a week. Um, in that week, you have to really be uh, aware of what's happening there. So and uh, uh, checking to make sure you have some good uh, regrowth there. So um, the next thing I'd kind of like to kind of get into a little bit here is uh, iron chlorosis in soybeans. So the question is, what causes yellow? Of, uh, yellowing of soybeans at that second to third trifoliate stage. Well, iron chlorosis could be one cause. Um, another cause, I'm just gonna advance my slide here, there we go. Um, another cause is just the, that, that period in which the, uh, the, the nodules haven't started to function yet, so you get an overall yellowing of the field. So trying to, you know, look at that, uh, I, you know, trying to look at that from the road and determine what it is, is rather difficult. You have to kind of go into it. Um, you can see here, this plant here, uh, I pulled up, uh, uh, I dug up a root here, and you can see some nodules starting to form here. Those nodules, when you cut into it, are still quite white yet, so they're not really fixing nodules. Um, it's got a decent-sized taproot. Um, it's actually going down pretty good to try to get some of that moisture here as well. Um, but there is a bit of an overall yellowing to the field. Now, you can have more than one thing happening in the field. So when I actually go into the field and look a little bit more closely, I do actually see the iron deficiency chlorosis symptoms, those typical intravenal yellowing, the dark green veins on the new growth. Um, in some cases, you see some necrotic tissue start to form here as well. Uh, that's a telltale sign of uh, IDC. 
Well, there's a few things to kind of keep in mind when it comes to IDC. Um, intensity, timing, longevity, uh, they vary from year to year. In bad years, it, can, it, it tends, uh, IDC catches us a bit unprepared. Um, um, and patience is, and close observation is required when, when you're looking at IDC to determine if that's actually IDC or if it's uh, just the overall yellowing of the field. Uh, a few things uh, uh, about IDC to also uh, uh, comment on is that it starts off as a generalized yellowing, um, and but it, but it quickly changes to that intravenal yellowing. So that's the difference between that versus uh, poor nodulation or the nodulation not uh, working at the time is that yellowing just uh, will dis dissipate once the plants start to nodulate and, and uh, the nodules start to function properly. Uh, symptoms can start in that second to third trifoliate. And the question I always get is, can it actually affect yield? Well, North Dakota State University has done some research, and, um, and uh, Kristen Podolsky has also done some research in Manitoba as well. Um, and uh, they have also seen that uh, uh, if IBC persists into the fifth and sixth trifoliate stage, that's when you're going to start seeing that, uh, uh, start to see a yield reduction. Uh, if it you know, goes yellow for a week, and grows out of it, generally there hasn't been uh, too much of an issue with uh, yield reduction in that case. Um, a little bit about the chemistry uh, and how it works. Uh, now there's a couple of things to keep in mind. Uh, first one is if you have wet soils with high levels of carbonates and salts, the plant can take up the iron, the iron gets tied up, so those plants start to yellow and start showing those symptoms. Um, you can also see it on dry years too. Um, if you have high salts, they can induce IDC symptoms. And in some cases, high fertility can also induce, or high nitrogen can also induce IBC symptoms as well. Um, fields with carbonate levels less than one and uh, salt levels less than, less than 0.3 micromoles per centimeter uh, would have a fairly low risk for IBC. And, but fields with carbonate levels greater than five and salt levels greater than one have a higher risk of, of, um, of iron chlorosis. So this, is, uh, this slide here is actually from the soybean fertility fact sheet that Manitoba Pulse and soybean growers have put together. And on this uh, little table here, it's based on the egg vice recommendations. You can see your carbonate levels here along the top, your salt levels along the bottom. When we were talking about those levels, uh, if you're greater than five on the carbonates and uh, salts are greater than one, um, you're looking at extreme or very high uh, levels. And you may ask yourself, where can I find some of this information? Well, when you do your soil test in fall, you can actually ask for that. And uh, you can ask for the carbonates and you can ask for the salts as well. And you can see here, this is from one of my, uh, from my fields here. My carbonate levels is, are uh, at 5.9%, which is considered high. Uh, my salt levels is, is 0.87, which is also is in, in the higher range. So going back to uh, the previous slide, and uh, what we'll see here is uh, we're seeing I'm, I'm in a relatively high zone when it comes to uh, uh, when it comes to IDC. So I have to be very selective on the varieties um, that uh, that I'm looking at. Um, now, patients, you know, again, going for, going away for a week after you start to see the first IDC symptoms, probably your best bet at this stage of the game. There's really no quick fix for it once it's in the field. Um, there are some products. Uh, soy green uh, is just to name one, one product, but it's the, uh, the iron chelate products. Uh, but those are typically used as a in uh, uh treatment at seeding time. Um, it's not really going to take a susceptible variety and make it tolerant. It'll take one that's uh, semi-tolerant, maybe make it a little bit more tolerant. But typically, it doesn't really have any effects uh, when you do it in crop. It's only as a seed treatment. Um, if you have high nitrate levels in the soil as well, um, you know, that's something that can affect uh, IDC as well, and you want to help draw those down. Um, probably the biggest thing that you can do, I guess, uh, with IDC right now, it's more of a learning experience at this point. Uh, picking an appropriate variety for, for, for a field, I think, is probably the best way to manage IDC. So if you already know you have a field with high carbonates and high salts, uh, if you go to Seed Manitoba or the Manitoba Soybean Variety Evaluation Guide, um, you'll see the following. Now, this is just a snapshot of, of Seed Manitoba and the ratings. And you can see here the various ratings based um, on the varieties that we grow in Manitoba and that we tested this past year. Um, I just posted here the early and, uh, or the very early and early season uh, uh, lines. And you can see here, there's quite a mixture. There's some that are considered tolerant. 
anything that when I rate these varieties, anything that is 1.7 and lower, I consider tolerant. Anything that is 2.3 and higher is considered susceptible. So if you see something that says a 2.3, um, you can, uh, that's in that case, um, you would see uh, intravenal yellowing starting. Um, and as it gets worse, if you see something that's at 2.9, then you're starting to see some necrotic tissue. And just to give you an idea, these are not company ratings. Uh, we actually have a site that is uh, right close to Winnipeg and actually where I'm going later, that, later this morning uh, to do some uh, evaluations at that site. Uh, each of the variety is tested at this, this particular site three times or three reps. And uh, we, do, we go back three times. So we have a total of nine ratings. So I go through each variety, give it a score. Um, I come back a week later, I score it again. And um, with that, what I can determine is, is that variety tolerant uh, or is it susceptible? Um, generally what happens is if a variety is tolerant, it stays green pretty much right through the whole three week period. It doesn't really yellow at all. Uh, if a variety is kind of in that semi-tolerant zone, so like from a 1.8 to about a 2.2, um, then generally what happens is it might start off at a high score, like at a 2.1 or 2.2, but over the course of the time period, it improves and it gets greener. And that to me tells me it's semi-tolerant, meaning that in extreme cases, you'll see IDC uh, occurring in the field, but it, it quickly um, uh, corrects itself. Now, if I'm seeing 2.3 or higher, then that tells me that that variety is really not suited for fields that have high, very high carbonates and high salts. And so that's why it's really important to have a good handle on what your, what your soil characteristics are. So those are some of the tools that you can use to help uh, with IDC moving forward. Um, I wanna throw this last slide up about IDC. This is from a field up in the Stonewall area. And I put some of the information on it. Uh, the carbonate levels were 11.3%. Uh, the salts were 1.42, so well above the, the numbers that anybody would uh, want to put uh, soybeans on. It actually came to a point where AgVice recommended that they do not plant soybeans on it. Um, but the reason, the reason the guy, the grower, wanted to have uh, soybeans on it because of the phosphate level was so high, 56 ppm. They wanted to try to draw that down, right? Nitrate levels was also very high, so that also contributed to the iron chlorosis in the field. So um, this field's... Um, it was still an, an okay yield, if you want to call it that. It was in that low 30 range. Um, the area average was a little bit higher than that, closer to 40. But any time it rained, any any kind of excessive moisture, you'd see these iron chlorosis symptoms show up. Um, I did not, uh, I don't recall what variety it was, but based on what I see here, uh, it was probably a fairly susceptible line. So again, just something for interest sake in this uh, discussion. Okay. Um, I'm going to move into the dry bean discussion now, and you notice in this particular slide, this is a, a slide of uh, some pinto beans with some soybeans mixed in. Um, soybeans are a real rotational concern when it comes to dry beans. Um, if you grow soybeans in year one, wheat, or any kind of cereal in year two, um, and then want to follow up with dry beans in year three, uh, this is what you might end up seeing at harvest time. Um, the soybeans tend to volunteer in, in that crop because the chemistry is the same that you'd spray on a soybean versus, or on a dry bean versus a, a soybean. Um, you'd be spraying Bassi Ground, the Viper, those, and, um, those types of products. Um, and they really don't do anything against the soybeans. Um, and I've seen uh, variations from anywhere from a half a percent soybeans in the sample all the way up to 10%. Now, you may ask yourself, well, why is soybean such a concern? Well, uh, soybeans are considered a food allergen in the dry bean industry. And if you have soybeans in the sample, uh, the buyer could reject those beans. So it's really important to make sure that uh, you follow that rotation and keep at least two years, two full growing seasons between soys and, and, and dry beans. Uh, in a lot of cases, what I would like to see is that fields that are suited for soybeans that may be a little bit more prone to flooding, not have dry beans on it. Um, and then fields are that are a little lighter, a um, little sandier ground, um, save those for your dry bean fields. Um, those ones, you'll get better yields all the way around and you won't have to deal with this concern. There is also the risk of contamination at harvest time as well, um, but typically dry beans are harvested before soybeans, so it's not as, it's not as critical in that, in that respect. Um, but uh, again, if you do end up harvesting your soybeans first, you really need to do a good clean out uh, before you get into your dry beans because uh, you don't want to end up having a load get to the, the bean plant and have it rejected. So, 
for driving acreage in Manitoba, we'll see a bit of a drop here this year, um, which isn't really a, a concerning at all. Uh, we're uh, we did I did some uh, a rough uh, survey of the industry here at last week, and we're probably projecting somewhere around that 153,000 acre range. Uh, last year we were at 185,000 acres, so that was a, a big number. We haven't seen that since probably mid 2000s, as you can see here. Um, yields last year were, were quite uh, uh, quite acceptable here. Um, we were uh, we were looking here in that uh, in that you know just shy of 2,000 pounds an acre in that 1,900 pound range. So very very pleased with the yields last year. This year, well, we'll kind of wait and see. Um, it's still kind of early yet. Um, the crop is established at this point, so we're, uh, we don't have any concerns that way. I'll talk a little bit about the wind damage in a moment that we had this past year. But uh, to give you a, a comparison here, um, our five and 10-year average is uh, just over 1,700 pounds per acre. And uh, last year, we, that means we were above the five-year average last year. So uh, pretty happy with the uh, uh, overall uh, acres here with, with dry beans. Um, I guess the, the biggest thing I kind of want to talk about, or two things, I guess, in this. The first thing is the, the wind damage that we saw uh, that Friday here in the Carmen Winkler areas. Uh, it was quite severe, um, in, uh, especially on some of the lighter soils. It really beat up those plants. And you can see here the, the lesions on the, on the uh, unifoliates here. Uh, in some cases, the worst field I saw was um, a field that was planted north-south, um, and the winds came from the west and it was planted at about 140,000 plants in a 30 inch row which is a lot higher than we, what we normally would plant at and when we did a stand count last week we were only at 40,000 plants um, so it really beat up and, and just removed plants totally I've been in fields where you know the unifoli gets stripped off and there's still a growing point there and it's all good but in that, this particular field uh, it was really stripped back so in that case we did decide to you know in the end just based on the time of year it was um, because we're at kind of at past the deadline already, uh, we decided that uh, the grower would uh, just leave it and see how it would uh, progress through the season. They'll have to try to keep it clean, so it might be another uh, application of Bassagrant to help keep that field nice and clean. Um, but we'll see what happens in the end. 40,000 is, is way lower than what you would normally have for a stand. Um, ideally, for a, a, a navy or a black bean, uh, you'd be planting at that. Uh, 120 range, 110 range to end up with around 90,000 plants. But to cut that in half down to 40, that's uh, that's a pretty thin stand. But you know, with uh, just what the year it was, it didn't make sense to go and replant anything into it. Uh, even replanting uh, into, let's say, another crop like canola, um, you're right at the tail end of of uh, crop insurance, anyways. And then if you have other canola um, uh, already planted early and it's looking good. Um, it doesn't uh, doesn't bode well to have a really late crop because it could affect your overall coverage if uh, if uh, if that field didn't perform very well. Um, but you can see here some additional slides of the wind damage. This is the most severe ones that I saw where the plants were still there, but they were pretty much beat up. And you can see here there's really not a lot of regrowth, so some of those plants aren't going to recover. Um, here, this one has a little bit more life to it. Here you can see that little bit of a trifolia coming here as well. Um, and uh, in the same field, you can also see this. So quite a range um, in uh, what those plants look like. Um, I did have a few growers replant um, right at the deadline, and uh, they were just going to take their chances and just go replant into it, uh, just offset the row, and, and they can do that because they felt that uh, certain and certain fields did get hit really hard. That the stands were. Uh, uh, require replanting, but I think overall we made it out okay. There should be enough regrowth there that should uh, uh, get a good crop coming through. Um, with that, moving forward, you know, with the wind damage that we saw, we're probably going to see more bacterial blight show up this this year. Um, bacterial blight, there's really no cure for it. Um, it usually shows up 10, 10 days or so more after a storm. This is some slides later in the season, but you can see here that these uh, these lesions on the lower leaves here. Um, basically coalesce and uh, take over the leaf. Uh, the new growth generally comes out fine. And a couple of points to kind of keep in mind with bacterial blight, um, with the wind that we had, that will bring those uh, symptoms forward. And you'll see more of that in the field uh, after that kind of weather. Uh, it can spread throughout the crop if growers are cultivating when the leaves are wet. So there's a cautionary note not to, not to cultivate when the leaves are wet. 
Right now, the plants are still quite small, so it's uh, the risk is quite low for spread that way, just because you're not really touching the plants. But if you're uh, cultivating later in the season and there's some bacterial blight, you want to be careful not to cultivate when the leaves are wet. Um, whether it's there's there's common blight, halo blight, or or brown spot, they all kind of basically affect the plants the same way. Just visual symptoms look a little different. Uh, control tips: um, disease-free seed, really important. Uh, if you're bringing in seed from the U.S., usually it's not a problem. Um, if you're planting, you know, if a grower was deciding to plant some of his own own seed, and um, and they had some disease issues with it, that can affect uh, you know bacterial blight as well. Um, two to three year of crop rotation, and I put this down, and I was looking at it yesterday, and I'm like, you know, in some fields, you might even be looking at a four year rotation on dry beans. If you're looking at a kidney bean, which is a lot more susceptible to uh, bacterial blight or, and the root rots as well, you should be maybe looking at a, at a four-year rotation between, uh, between the kidney plants just to help prevent that disease from moving forward and also the root rot issue as well. Um, trying to uh, bury those plants as soon as possible to allow that to, to break down. Um, that, that can cause some erosion issues, so you, it's going to have to be done on a field-by-field -field basis based on the soil type. Uh, to determine whether or not uh, if it's a late sandy soil and you're working it too much in fall, you could be very prone to soil erosion. So this one's a little bit trickier to do if the ground's a little bit uh, heavier or if you're looking at maybe putting a bit of a cover crop on there to help uh, keep that soil from blowing. Those are some considerations as well. Um, Copper-based fungicides, um, there are some products listed in the guide for, for the spread of halo blight, but they're only moderately effective. They must be applied early, you know, a lot of times before it's uh, before the symptoms even start, and repeatedly, and that's the key. And and repeatedly, you can't just do it once and, and think that it's going to take care of it. Um, there is a, some other products that re recently come to light as well. They're a hydrogen peroxide-based product. Um, I wanted to throw this slide up. This is from uh, University of Guelph. Uh, they did some work on on a product here called Oxidate. And uh, and also parasol and sandbait, which is you know, uh, products in that same uh, uh, same use pattern, I guess, trying to use to help control bacterial blight in the field. Um, so what they did is they did a leaf severity ratings, and they went seven, 13, 19, and 26 days after application, and they had both uninoculated and inoculated plots, and then they looked at the different treatments. So they all these treatments were applied once. And then they looked to see if there were any visual differences in leaf severity. So as you can see here, after seven days, um, the oxidate uh, one, it was basically the same as the uh, um, uh, inoculated control. Uh, you see the two A's, there's no real significant difference there. Um, same with the uh, copper-based products, no significant difference in leaf severity. When they went 13 days out, everything's the same. 19 days out, everything's the same. Uh, as the inoculated control, and um, same as with the uh, 28, 26 days out. So even though products like this are registered, they are registered for multiple applications. Um, the, uh, the hydrogen peroxide-based products uh, are very short-lived. There, there's really no kind of per se residue that remains on the plant. It basically just kills everything that's there. But if you are looking at using something else to help control bacterial blight, uh, do some research. Find out you know, how many times you may need to spray, because it's not going to be just a one-time spray. Uh, North Dakota State University did do a, sim a similar study to this as well. Uh, with their results, what they found is they did actually see some, some visual, um, uh, or the, the leaves looked better, but in the end, the yield was no different. And in this case, we'll put the next slide up here. And with all these products that they used here, you can see the yield in, uh, in uh, kilograms per, per hectare um, didn't really vary. They were all very similar uh, with all the treatments. So in this case, it didn't really uh, increase your yield in that, in that case. Um, this is a very busy slide, and I'm not really going to go through all of it. Um, this is available. This is in the guide, a, a list of weed control products on that you can use on dry beans. Um, you have some pre-plant um, uh, products you can use. You have some post-emergent plant uh, products you can use as well um, for various weeds that you have. Um, there's a lot of notations in here. Um, there are certain products that you only use on specific bean types. Um, there are specific requirements on the areas that you can use it in. So for example, Reflex can only be used in the Red River Valley. Um, it's only registered for that uh, and um, and should also be included with Bastard Grant as well. Viper is pretty much all over uh, that it can be used, but the staging, you have to really be careful with the staging. 
The reason I throw this up is um, I want to do a little bit of a different angle uh, with dry beans. Um, dry beans, when it comes to herbicide residue, uh, maximum residue levels, it's a very important topic in that in this industry. And uh, as a grower, you should be aware of what products are available to you and which products that uh, may have concerns moving forward. Um, before and after spraying, uh, there's a few things you need to consider when you're looking at dry beans. Um, are there any market requirements for the products that you're spraying it on? Um, the products that I had listed there, generally everything is good there, but you have to also be aware of the pre-harvest interval of those products. Um, if, you're uh, if you're trying to think of trying something new on a dry bean product, you might want to try, make sure it's registered first. Um, just because uh, a number of the bean companies that have contracts uh, do require you to only use registered pesticides. Um, is a crop going to be tolerant? Uh, is the pest that you're spraying for going to have any economic loss? And then the pre-harvest interval is always a real concern as well. Um, I'm going to move ahead one slide here and go to this last slide that I have here. Um, I pulled some information from the Gaija Crop Protection and on some of the products that we spray in dry beans. And I've listed the pre-harvest interval and for a discussion point, I use the harvest slash cutting date of September 1st. So that means uh, and then I worked it backwards. So uh, Bentazone or Bastogran, um, I used the harvest date of uh, September 1st. Now, um, uh, I did check into it. It does not list a pre-harvest interval, um, but you typically wouldn't be spraying it past flowering. So that would be kind of in that July 13th area. But there are some products like Reflex, Bastogran combination, and it's mostly the Reflex. Uh, in that case, they give it an 84-day pre-harvest interval. So that means if your projected harvest date is um, September 1st, your last spray date would be June 9th. So we're well past that now. And Reflex also has staging requirements as well. So you have to uh, pay attention to that. Um, something like Viper only has a 60 day pre-harvest interval. So uh, we're probably in a lot of those right now where we're still, uh, Viper would probably be one of the last products you could probably uh, still spray yet, as well as Bassigran. Um, even something like Pulse Ultra, um, you have an 80-day uh, pre-harvest interval there. Um, and Cleodem is 60 days or Centurion, there, that is there. So those are some of the things you really need to be concerned with. So if you're trying to do some late weed escapes, uh, you might want to check to see like what products you can use safely. And, um, and also too, because it's such a concern with the buyers, um, the concern comes in um, when a product comes into a, a facility and then is sent out to overseas to a, to a uh, to an end user, um, they may test for herbicide residue levels. And if they're looking for certain um, uh, products in there and they find it, then that load could be rejected. It was a real issue uh, with pre-harvest glyphosate um, uh, a number of years ago, and uh, it's the last two years has really become uh, brought to the forefront. And uh, at this point, uh, and most of the companies uh, will not allow pre-harvest glyphosate on beans. Um, and there are some companies that still may, but then they also require uh, the grower to sign off on uh, when they spray to make sure they don't spray too early. Um, if you're going into, uh, for example, into the UK, you have a maximum residue level of two parts per million. Um, if you're uh, going into a specific buyer, they may even reduce it to one part per million. What, and basically what that means is if you're spraying it on according to label, you probably will be fine and even at the two parts per million, million. But if the field is sprayed early or if there's a lot of unevenness in the field, then your, uh, your MRL could be, uh, uh, could be a much higher than that, two, or close to the two parts per million or even higher than that. So those are the reasons why the post harvest interval and the uh, uh, need to be, uh, or, and maximum residue levels have been a bit of a concern over the years. So, so keep those post harvest uh, intervals in mind. So know when you can spray your last product. And as far as the MRLs, if you're doing um, you know pre-harvest application, know uh, determine ahead of time what products that you can use on your on your beans that are going to be uh, good for your buyers. So uh, with that, I'm going to wrap it up. That's my last slide here. So um, I'll I'll throw it back to Lionel here for any potential questions. Okay, Dennis, uh, great. Uh, there is a few questions that have come in. Um, one, uh, I guess is this is when you were talking about the uh, nodules on soybeans and 
Uh, the question is, at what stage in the plant growth should we see nodules starting to produce? You'll start to see uh, nodules in, in that second to third trifoliate stage. So uh, those plants that I, I showed earlier, that were there right at that stage. Um, and um, so right this week, you'll start to see nodules uh, next two weeks. And then what you need to do is um, just monitor that for you know about a week or so and watch for the nice pink uh, nodules inside. That will be the sign that they're functioning properly. Okay. And uh, is there any is there any difference between inoculants and the start of nodulation? Um, not that I've seen so far. Um, it's uh, the weather does play a little bit of a role in that. Uh, being that it's a little drier this year in some regions, I, I would expect nodulation to maybe be a little bit more delayed. Um, the only reason for that is the plant is not maybe growing as aggressively as uh, as what it would be when you have more moisture. Um, I think it's still important to kind of monitor nodulation, like we're going to start to see it in that second to third trifoliate stage. Um, and then once you start getting into fourth and fifth node stage and, and into flowering, um, that's I think when it's really important to determine if there's good nodulation. Because if you don't have nodulation by flowering, then there's considerations you might need to look at for rescue treatments if you don't have any nodulation. Now, if you have at least a few nodules and they're functioning, that's probably going to be enough to do the job. But if there's none, then you have to look at another another alternative for a rescue treatment. Okay, and and this one is uh, it says I'm first time grower of soybeans, and my beans look to be thin this year. My counts are good. At what stage do they start to fill in the rows? Um, well, it depends on the row spacing. Um, if you're in a 30 inch row, sometimes those rows can be uh, open till almost the end of July. Um, I've seen that even in the Carmen area where they have, you know, typically lush growth. Um, and again, you know, it depends on how much moisture we get this year. Some years they don't really close in. Some years you have some gaps in between there. Um, that is probably the one difference between uh, the row crop versus the solid seed is that your weed control may end up having an extra application of weed control in that in the row crop if you don't get row closure just to uh, uh, control those weeds coming up between so okay and then the last one here is uh, uh, you, you've talked a bit about uh, the dry conditions and uh, how critical is it to get rain in the next 10 to 14 days on the soybean crop well, I think for the most part right now, we have establishment. Um, I've talked to many growers around the province and I think we have pretty good establishment of the soybean. So uh, that's the first step where moisture is really critical. Um, the soybean plant is starting to uh, push its taproot down now um, from the slide that you uh, we saw earlier, uh, that taproot is getting going down to try to get some of that moisture. Um, it'd be wonderful to get a rain now. Uh, I think it would be beneficial to some degree, but even more beneficial is um, you know, it, getting rain in that early uh, pod fill stage. Um, so later on into July, um, that's where that's what really makes the yield. Like you can have good moisture now, but if it turns dry in July and August, that's when we had those 17, 18, and 19 where the where the yields had uh, dropped in Manitoba because it was so dry during that time period. So rain is good now, but rain is more important in July and August. Okay. And one last comment that came through is this that you on the tractor? It is 1976, a brand new Massey 285. <laughs> well, you're a lot taller now. Ah, uh, just a tad, but you can tell farming's always been uh, always been with me. So, okay, uh, good. Well, thanks, Dennis. That was a good presentation. And uh, Lori, if you could turn the screen over to me, which you did, great. Thank you. We will head into our crop scouting panel. And um, I'm going to start off with uh, a question that was uh, we talked about last week and uh, it was, uh, and I noticed some in the, something in the fall rye where I was seeing some white heads and uh, the heads I was seeing, uh, I was able to pull them out uh, fairly easy. And we were at John Gavoski talking about wheat stem maggot. And then uh, there was uh, some conversation throughout the week regarding some uh, some other things that might be happening out there. And uh, uh, Rajon, uh, Rajon is uh, 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 one of the uh, I guess uh, the adaptation specialists uh, working with me, and he uh, he uh, has a few comments on what he's been seeing in some of the fields. Yes. Good morning. 
You can hear me okay? You bet. Good, good. Yeah, so uh, just as we see the slide here, there's a few pictures showing up, and I thought it was interesting because actually those pictures, this is Paul Rye, taken uh, somewhere near to Glenboro, and within a few steps, uh, those pictures were taken. See, if I go from the very right one on the on the right side of the screen, I think it's a normally looking or maybe somewhat uh, discolored a little bit head. Anyway, it looks relatively normal. The one right next to it to the left is one where there's a wheat stem maggot that actually feeds below just above the top node and uh, basically kills the tissue just above that because it doesn't get any more moisture and nutrients so it dries up. So when you pull on that head, the whole thing will come, come out right down to the to that upper node, and you can see some chewing at the base there. So, so that head is done; it's finished. Uh, to the left of that, a little bit, we see some. Uh, actually, the next two to the left, uh, to the very left of the screen here, we see some very discolored uh, and uh, somewhat uh, mangled uh, heads there. So, it's. Uh, it seems to be relating to more what happened back in late May. There was some frost there that uh, I guess Dennis talked about just a few minutes ago. And far right at that time, usually far right heads are in uh, late May this year, maybe early June. So those heads would have been in the elongating uh, stage uh, near to the boot. So that very delicate tissue exposed to frost. And in southern Manitoba, here we had minus one to, to two for up to 10 hours in some locations closer to uh, uh, to minus five or even less than that closer to Lake Manitoba. But uh, anyway, this is again south uh, south of Glenboro. Some some of the tissue there we see the whole head is not uh, killed like we see with the wheat stem maggots. So it's more uh, the tissue that was damaged during the, that frost period. We can see that wheat head is is bleached. And so, but again, not completely dead. We can see part of the head is still green, and so there will be, should be some production out of that. But again, it's a, a different condition than what we see with the wheat stem maggot there. Okay, thanks, Rajan. Uh, we'll go to the uh, next question now. Um, I guess. Uh, in keeping with uh, some of the pulse things, we've been seeing some issues with uh, P nodulation. And uh, Dennis, uh, I think you have a few comments to make regarding what you've been seeing. Uh, yes, Lionel, can you throw the screen back over to me here? Okay, Laurie. Alrighty, I'm just gonna pull up the next slide here. The next one here, okay. So um, earlier this, or late last week, um, MPSG gave us a call um, to talk about the nodulation issue that they're seeing in some pea fields, not all, but in some pea fields in Manitoba. Um, and uh, what they were seeing in some cases is that some fields had very high levels of nitrogen uh, in the soil. They did some uh, soil tests and uh, they're finding that the pea fields had very high nitrogen levels and um, they're not seeing any nodules on some fields. So um, in talking with John, uh, uh, John Hurd, and uh, he brought up the point that uh, they call it the birch effect. So when you have soils that become dry during the summertime because of lack of rain, or they're dry in the lab, you can get, um, you know, and then you get some re-wetting uh, after with precipitation or irrigation, you have a burst of decomposition, mineralization, and release of uh, inorganic nitrogen. And those levels on those fields are showing up to be quite high, and quite high meaning that they're ranging from 100 pounds to, well, in some cases, almost 200 pounds of nitrogen. Um, now is a critical time for nodulation in peas. When you're in that nine to 10 node stage, you're getting very close to flowering. And um, if you're going and doing an assessment in your field and you're fi not finding any nodules, um, you need to you may need to uh, assess that so um, John's put together a bit of a recommendation list and this can also be found in the bean report that just came out this week uh, from Manitoba Pulse and Soybean Growers uh, so there's a bit of a checklist so uh, according to Sask, Sask Pulse there's a checklist you can kind of go through to, to give it to give you a nodulation score um, you want to check for N deficiencies um, as in yellowing of the lower leaves because it's the older leaves that are going to yellow first with nitrogen deficiencies and as long as the yield potential is, is good, you may want to consider the following. Um, an application of 50 pounds of N at the nine plus node stage before flowering. And that is mainly just so you can actually get into the canopy. That's probably the biggest consideration there. Um, 
you need to apply as a granulate fertilizer. Um, so the granules can go through the through the uh, through the canopy, and you do not want to use a 2800 solution because you will you will get leaf burn, and I can't stress that enough. I've seen that growers try that in soybeans, and oh my goodness, I just I, I was shocked at to what the, there was wasn't much left of that field afterwards. Um, you need to broadcast that at uh, you know before rain because it's only helpful if you can if the uh, the rain can take it into the soil. Um, and uh, you know if the nodulation is inhibited by the high soil, soil nitrate levels, uh, that might be a consideration uh, to to do this because uh, a 50 bushel crop removes about 115 pounds of nitrogen. Um, so any additional uh, so additional end may be required for seed fill. So just to kind of quickly summarize this, what I would look at is um, gently dig up a few plants in the field, um, seeing if you find any nodules and seeing if they're nice and pink inside. If you are, then you're good. Um, if you're digging up plants and you're not finding any nodules um, and you're at that nine plus node stage, ideally it would be great to do a soil test. Um, but if you are looking at doing anything as a bit of a rescue treatment, then that's when I would consider um, broadcasting 50 pounds of ant um, at that stage. Again, it's not going to be every field. It's going to be, you know, it, it's just something that we're seeing out there this year and something to kind of keep in mind. So that's kind of what I had on that one. So. Okay, I think uh, John is on the line. John, do you have any uh, other comments to uh, make? Well, j j just that uh, for uh, back of the envelope calculation done across the kitchen table, uh, it looks pretty official when uh, Dennis presents it there. He presents it well. And I want people to know that this is just a, uh, a suggestion. Is a real lack of uh, research on this. So it's a suggestion. I call it a suggestion, not a recommendation. But it's, uh, it's for pe folks that are feeling desperate and uh, wanting to address that. So um, um, I've been by some fields and some fields got that dark green and then they've got some kind of light limey type colors in the field. Is that kind of fields that you would think might be showing some of this? No, uh, you talked to Kim Brown about that. Maybe she's got a story to do with lines and fields and poor pea growth. If Kim's on the line, she wants to speak up about that. Yeah, not really lines in field, but just a lime color, like not a dark green color, but a light color. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, don't be deceived by the tops. Check the roots. Yeah. Okay, good. Thanks, John. Uh, next question for uh, Dave Kaminsky. Um, seeing quite a few canola fields because of our... Uh, flea beetle problem we've had this year where we've got plants that are bolting, we've got plants that are, you know, four or five leaf stage, and then we got plants that are, you know, one leaf stage. Um, how do I make a fungicide spraying decision? Uh, should I be targeting what stage of the plant growth in your mind would be the best start? What is your, I guess, on something like this? Well, uh, Lionel, I think it depends on which stage you're depending on to give you yield. And I think in many cases where you have a stagey crop like that, um, the stand of the plants that are bolting right now is pretty thin. And perhaps the ones that are coming on behind are a little bit better. I've seen fields that are in pretty much full flower down here in the valley. And um, I see lots of fields that are in early stages of flowering. So when you have a two-stage crop like that, um, you can really only get sclerotinia infection when petals begin falling down on the crop. So those more mature plants are going to be dropping um, petals onto the crop and potentially causing infection, but uh, they have to be carrying spores too. And I think the chances of uh, spores being on those petals is slim to none. Um, the reason is soil surfaces have been completely dry for quite some time. So we don't have apothecia forming anywhere, not even in uh, better cereal crops on canola stubble, for instance. 
Okay, that's um, that's good. I keep holding my fungicide dollars until you uh, see how that second crop is coming on. And stage it that way. Okay, so then you're saying even in cereal crops because they're fairly thin, uh, where we would normally be looking for the uh, you know the infection yeah. coming from, they're not even developing there. Right, you won't find it. Okay, good. Uh, while I've got you on, Dave, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep firing questions at you. Uh, the question I've been getting lately is, uh, do I look at doing a spray for leaf disease or do I look at doing a spray for fusarium? Uh, I guess the past few years, it's been pretty, pretty common that most of the fields have been getting sprayed. Um, I guess your opinion right now, I threw up the fusarium head blight risk map. Uh, comments on spraying for uh, leaf disease and cereal crops. David, are you still there? Sorry, Lionel. Yeah, if you see a uh, leaf disease developing in the crop that you know is not a bacterial disease, um, it might be prudent to be applying a fungicide now. I think the risk of fusarium head blight at the moment is minimal. Um, you've seen that the map has gone from red last week to completely green this week. And I believe that is a true indication of the fusarium risk because for infection to occur, you need heat and humidity coinciding with flowering. And uh, depending on the stage of your crop, um, I don't see any humidity happening over the next little while. Um, the temperatures have recently been dropping down below even 10 degrees overnight. So in those conditions, you rarely see uh, any possibility of head blight taking hold. Okay, and um, I guess if, uh... Even with the leaf disease, we're probably not seeing, or I haven't been seeing a whole bunch of leaf disease yet. Um, no. Comment, what comment we've been I seeing all over the final is uh, bacterial blight in oats. That uh, was my comment. And in lots of different varieties. Um, so it's not necessarily, it really isn't a seed borne thing as we might have been suspicious of earlier on. Um, it's a common thing. Bacterial blights don't need much moisture in order to get started. Um, they, like uh, the other crops that Dennis was mentioning, cereal crops, um, oats too is affected by um, soil blasting and those kinds of things, which cause wounding on the leaves and an avenue for infection. Um, we've seen some pretty intense symptoms and you know that fungicides do nothing against bacterial diseases. So you've just got to uh, grin and bear it on that front. Um, I always caution folks though that, um, you know, it's the photosynthetic area of the flag leaf that's most important for head filling, but our eye is drawn to the disease portion. And we often overestimate how much of the photosynthetic area is lost. So. Great, good, good comments, David. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask you about the oats because uh, uh, field on uh, Monday I was in, and there was definitely you could see something happening with the oats leaf. So bacterial blight has been probably the biggest issue there. Yeah, uh, an agronomist colleague of ours was uh, traveling yesterday and looking at oats and seeing the symptom right from Altona across to Boisevane and beyond. I don't know about uh, further north, but uh, right across southern Manitoba, um, it's being noticed and catching a lot of people's eye. Great. Okay, good, thanks, David. Uh, next question to John Gavlosky. Uh, I was starting to get some phone calls about the dry conditions and grasshoppers and some guys are talking about uh, 
grasshoppers flying and I made a call to John and he gave me some good information. I thought it'd be good for him to share it with us here uh, this morning. Yeah, uh, thanks, Lennon. Really good question. Uh, yeah, the first point I'd like to make is that not everything that hops is a hopper and anything flying this early isn't a pest grasshopper. So when you're out there doing your you're scouting in the ditches, the field edges, and you see a lot of hopping activity. It is really good if you do have an insect net or something that you can sweep a sample and see what's there. Um, in your photo on the left, you have a leaf hopper. This photo is of a potato leaf hopper, a tiny little one. Um, when leaf hoppers are abundant, they'll be jumping around and um, they can be mistaken for the newly hatched grasshoppers. They're usually quite small. Now, leafhoppers are extremely abundant. Um, there's over a thousand species in Canada. There's two species in Manitoba that could be pests. This species here, potato leafhopper and aster leafhopper. There's a lot of non-pest ones, so don't confuse them with grasshoppers. Um, the grasshoppers you have to worry about are the ones with the shorter antenna, and uh, we've got four species that potentially can be pests. They're all juveniles still. It'll be at least early July before they're adults. So if you are seeing the odd grasshopper with wings, it's probably one of the non-pest species that won't be moving into your crops to do much damage or don't occur in big numbers. Um, so yeah, the flying grasshoppers this early would be non-pest species. Okay, John, and uh, just, uh, I guess uh, we always see every year with the aster yellows in canola, and we always get the question is, you know, can I spray for them? Uh, maybe just uh, comment on whether that's even something that you should be looking at. Yeah, uh, the, the tricky thing with aster leafhopper and aster yellows is in field crops, there's really nothing you can do. Um, in horticulture crops, if we know that we've both got a lot of aster leafhoppers and that those leafhoppers have a high level of infectivity, then the vegetable growers will go on these weekly spray programs. They cannot eliminate aster yellows, but they can at least reduce it to uh, acceptable levels by doing that. And that is economical in a horticulture situation. In a field crop situation, doing weekly insecticide applications would not be economical. Uh, so the short answer is there's really nothing you can do anyway if you do have aster leaf hoppers. Uh, some have blown in this year. I've been collecting samples. I've been sending them away for testing for percent, peri peri uh, sorry, percent pathogenicity with the aster yellows virus. Um, right now, I don't really know what the percent um, of the leaf hoppers that have the pathogen is. Uh, I'll be getting those results back really soon. And we'll po post that in our crop pest update. But the levels we've been seeing, again, um, probably nothing that you can do anything about regardless in field crops. Okay, and uh, maybe just a comment on the, uh, you're looking for samples of the cereal Cereal leaf beetle, yes. That's the one we're testing for, for parasitism. So, yeah, cereal leaf beetle, um, what you will see is on any of your cereals, um, the larva would make long white streaks in the leaves. And don't confuse their streaking for something like thrips. Thrips, will, it'll be more of a, a mottled white patterns, whereas with the cereal leaf beetle, it's very distinct long white strips in the leaves. If you start seeing that, uh, please get in touch with me, let me know, especially if you're seeing what look like tiny little oily um, specks next to those streaks, because that's likely the cereal leaf beetle larvae. It's a, I'll say newer pest in Manitoba. We've had it for over a decade. Um, it hasn't got to high levels. It hasn't been economical, but I think part of the reason is we've been releasing parasitoids that are really good at targeting and controlling cereal leaf beetle. And I want to know um, what percent of the cereal leaf beetle larvae out there are infected with this parasite. So we're collecting samples and testing that. So if you do think you've got cereal leaf beetle, give me a call and we'll try to get a sample from your field. Great. Thanks, John. 
Uh, oh, one more question for you, John. Um, we're getting into flowering time uh, and for on peas. And just a quick comment on aphids and should producers or what should be producers be watching for for spraying for uh, aphids? Yeah, so with pea aphid, um, they are starting to show up in peas, but um, the reports that I've had, which are mainly from research plots, are that the levels right now are very low, so nothing of economic significance. Um, but they, uh, it is something you want to be looking for when the peas start flowering. Uh, flowering is the ideal time for scouting. It's not terribly difficult. Uh, you can do it two ways. You can either grab a sweep net and uh, go do some sweeping, or you can just take a handful of plant tips and shake them over a tray or something and try to figure out on average how many uh, pea aphids are there per uh, plant tip. And uh, if you're using the sweep net, you're looking at a boat, um, in, a, in a 10 sweep sample, it would be about 90 to 120 aphids. If you're shaking the plant tips, it would be about two to three aphids per plant tip on average for your thresholds. If you're at those levels, what you have to protect is the young pods. So getting an insecticide on when the, the plants are producing young pods would be what you'd want to target. Great, thanks John. Uh, Kim, um, seeing this uh, weed uh, showing up in a lot of uh, uh, sloughs, uh, seems to be taking over the sloughs basically uh, yeah, from kind of the water's edge right through to the, the tree edge or the edge of the field. Um, can you maybe make a comment on what this is and uh, if it's uh, some concern? Uh, yeah, thanks, Lionel. Um, I'm pretty sure that's marsh ragwort. It's actually a, a groundsel. It's in the same family as like uh, common groundsel. So we do see it show up. It doesn't go into the really, really wet areas. Um, it does. It's just um, it seems to show up on the edges. And some years, I don't know why, but some years we see a lot of it, and then other times we don't see it at all. And lots of times you'll see just a ring of this around the slough, so it won't go right into the really wet part of the slough, but it'll be on that edge. So I wouldn't worry about it much. Um, I don't know whether or not um, it's got any value or, or any problems if it's baled and used for livestock feed. I know sometimes producers will do that around the edges of the sloughs because, you know, there is some feed value in, in weeds like kochia if they're fed carefully. Um, so that I don't know. I can try to look that up and see if I can find some information. But um, yeah, we do see it occasionally. And all of a sudden, it is a year. I've seen quite a bit of it too. It just seems to be showing up this year. Um, and yeah, it'll uh, those little uh, seed heads, they'll be white seed heads, like a, like the fluff. Uh, the seeds will be flying around at the same time. You've still got flowers on the same plant. So all that fluff is flying around. But that's not going to be a concern in your crop. That's not going to be a weed that's going to show up in next year because it really needs to be moist, it needs to be on the edges of those sloughs, or if our sloughs have dried up, it'll be kind of into the middle where it's still kind of spongy and a bit wet. So. Okay, good. Uh, a weed that kind of shows up and it's bright yellow, so it does, it does attract your attention, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. It's good for pollinators. Sometimes we look at these weeds, they don't really hurt us too much and they're good for pollinators, so they're not a bad thing. Good, yeah, good point. Um, I guess that includes uh, the, uh, the uh, questions for this week. Uh, so uh, just a couple of things. Uh, seeded acreage report deadlines is coming up, so make sure you're uh, on top of that. Uh, just again to mention, if you're short of water or want to improve your dugouts or uh, your watering systems, uh, there are, is a program through the Environmental Farm Plan, and here's again the information for that. Uh, we're into ins well, finishing insects, hopefully, and we're into plant disease, so uh, all that information is in your field crop guide. The contact information for the ag adaptation specialists in the province, so uh, uh, please feel free to give any one of these people a call if you have questions or need some information. And join us next week, uh, June the 30th, for the next edition of Crop Talk. Thanks for attending.